This evening, we are fortunate to have Professor Alejandra Castro as our speaker to tell us about this challenge and how we are trying to overcome it. Professor Castro graduated from Pontifical Catholic University of Chile with maximum distinction. The country of Chile, Chile has a great tradition in the research in general relativity and her undergraduate mentor, Professor Maximo Banedas, is a famous theorist who made groundbreaking discovery in the gravity. Professor Castro received her PhD from the University of Michigan in 2009 after a postdoctoral appointment at McGill and Harvard, she moved to the University of Amsterdam in 2013, where she is an associate professor. Her work has advanced our understanding of quantum mechanics, of black holes, and many other gravitational phenomena. She also discovered that rapidly rotating black holes, uh, which are abundant in our universe, have hidden symmetry, and she used the symmetry to explain property of these black holes. She's a distinguished scientist and wonderful speaker, and I look forward to her talk. The title is Engineering Gravitational Theories. Please welcome Professor Castro. Thank you, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, thank you for those of you that are brave, <laughs> brave to know and are here. It's, a, it's an honor to be giving this uh, public lecture. So in the conference this week, as Hiroshi was saying, um, is on quantum gravity, and in particular about low dimensional theories of quantum gravity. By low, we mean that we right now are in a three spatial dimensional room. Low means that we're studying gravitational systems in one or two dimensions. Now, that sounds very theoretical. It sounds... Uh, a very abstract, which it is. And it sounds very, very specific, you might sound. It's like a very tiny corner of theoretical physics, these, these handful of people that study these theories of quantum gravity. But uh, what I want to um, challenge you to, because I know that you run into us on the street, <laughs> uh, is to ask us, uh, what do we do? What is our expertise? What is our research uh, field? And if you start asking us, uh, you're going to start noticing that the answers will differ. And this is because in this area of physics, uh, you require more than just one expertise. So for instance, uh, you will stumble into participants at our conference that will say, I'm an expert in general relativity. I study black holes. That is my expertise. Uh, there will be other uh, participants that will tell you, uh, I'm an expert in quantum field theory. And we have many different types of expertise in quantum field theory. It ranges from uh, participants that are experts in supersymmetric theories or axiomatic properties of, of quantum field theory and so forth. Uh, then there will be some uh, expertise in mathematics. One of the areas of mathematics that has come through our conference is number theory, for instance. There's also expertise in solid state physics, in condensed matter physics. There's an expertise, a lot of it, on quantum information. And what I want to do with this lecture is to convey to you why do we need this very broad and vast set of expertise to answer questions about quantum gravity. And in that context, I want to put a lot of emphasis in the collaborations and the synergies and how we discuss and how we exchange ideas. Okay, so it will not be a lecture about an individual. It will not be a lecture about one genius. It will be a lecture about how all of us and all our combined expertise are pushing for the advancement of the field. And in that, oh, thank you. <laughs> and in that context, I find it very useful to make an analogy with engineering. Uh, because engineering is a field that is characterized by teamwork and collaboration. You don't build a building by yourself, right? Um, and so imagine, let, let me, for the purpose of the analogy, I'm making this ties with engineering, that our goal is to build a skyscraper or whatever infrastructure you feel key enough. And in, in engineering, like the basic concepts uh, that you need are basically blueprints. You need to know what is your design. Uh, you require materials. 
you require tools, right? Otherwise, you can't build a building. Now, in the context as a theoretical physicist, I'm going to use these keywords to encompass basically uh, our principles and laws. So the blueprints are going to encapsulate that. Uh, the materials are basically going to be the particles that we have and how they interact. The geometry as well will be viewed as a material. And the tools basically is the mathematics, the equations, and how we try to solve them. How do we find creative solutions in finding uh, ways to advance and use them for the appropriate materials that we have and implement them as we need to satisfy various constraints and objectives, okay? Now, all of this is going to, the, this analogy with engineering is going to be presented in the context of gravitational phenomena. And this gravity will happen, happens in nature, it manifests itself at different scales in different ways. So we're going to take a journey, okay? So we're going to encounter gravity at very, very, very different scales. We're going to start with our classical notion of gravity described by Newtonian physics, and hopefully, by the end, we're going to get to the concept uh, of quantum gravity. This is a complicated path. This is not an easy path to take. There will be various obstacles. There will be a lot of interesting physics happening along the way. In particular, we're going to uh, discuss the theory of general relativity, and we're going to discuss a lot during this talk uh, black holes where the quantum is going to start moving the classical. And in order to describe this road and understand how we're constructing and building objects, one of the key uh, topics that I'm going to use is what's called this holographic principle that I'll introduce uh, to you. And so in the engineering uh, spirit, roughly speaking, black holes are going to provide for me guidance. They're going to tell me what are the phenomena that I need to describe what, and how the, the rules and, and implementations of the design should capture that phenomena. And the holographic principle uh, for the purpose of this lecture is going to be viewed as basically the tools and the materials that I need to implement these ideas. And the final goal is to have this magnificent building uh, ready for you, which is what going to be the theory of quantum gravity. Very good. So the structure of this lecture is going to be into three parts. We're first going to have a very broad panoramic view of what is physics. So where do I put quantum gravity in the context of other areas of physics that we're familiar with? And then we're going to go into the realm of black holes and what are the rules that they're dictating for me. And finally, we're going to uh, get into our hands dirty and start implementing and constructing via this holographic principle. So, are we ready? <laughs> yes. <laughs> if not, uh, you will have to be. <laughs> We're stuck here. Okay. Let's first talk about uh, this panoramic view. So, just a big overview of what is physics uh, in, a, in a simple manner. So, in physics, uh, we like to measure things. We like to quantify uh, phenomena that happens in nature. And three basic quantities that we use to quantify phenomena are basically determined by the speed at which that phenomena is occurring, its size, and its mass. For instance, we like to measure there will be different types of objects that we quantify, different types of phenomena occurring that can move very slow or could be moving very fast. Uh, we will be looking at objects that are very big or very small, and objects that are very light or very heavy, okay? Depending on where you find yourself, we have different set of equations and different set of theories that describe those different type of phenomena. So if I stick myself to the bottom uh, of this drawing, the three uh, basic theories that we have at hand are classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, and uh, special relativity. What are their distinguishing features? Well, classical mechanics is basically uh, very, very, very good at describing objects that move very, very slowly. They're very, very big. Well, uh, they're big, uh, and they're very light, okay? In contrast, special relativity, for instance, the main difference in contrast to classical mechanics is that objects move very fast, okay? 
Now, in the back of that picture, quantum mechanics, in contrast with classical mechanics, it's, uh, the, the important difference here is the size of the objects. So in, in, in quantum mechanics, objects are very, very small, okay? So this is the main characteristics of the theories that we use to describe different phenomena depending on the scale that we're interested in. But uh, it doesn't end there, so we can also complete this into a cube. And uh, there's other theories that we encounter. We encounter then general relativity, uh, quantum field theory, and quantum gravity. And the main characteristics here uh, is basically, um, again, the, depending on where are you in the cube, is what uh, they're mostly good at. And one of the most successful uh, frameworks in theoretical physics that has been paramount in describing all sorts of phenomena is the subject of quantum field theory. So this is extremely important in particle physics, understanding electrons, protons, quarks, everything that we're made of, the language that we use is the language of quantum field theory, which basically brings together special relativity and quantum mechanics. Now, on the, the other very successful framework uh, that we love, especially in this conference, is general relativity. So general relativity is extremely good at describing objects that are very big, very heavy, and that move also very fast. So it basically brings together classical mechanics and special relativity, okay? So this, oh, sorry. This theory up here is capable of describing all of this side of the, of the cube. And what we want is basically to get to that theory of uh, quantum gravity. Now, to be a little bit more precise and give this axis uh, some uh, parameters, we use fundamental constants in physics to describe each of these axes, the mass, the size, and the speed. So for the size, we use what's called Planck's constant, H bar. Okay, so this is telling us uh, basically how quantum you are or if you're classical. This is the fundamental constant that describes this. Uh, the speed of light is what we use to measure how fast you're going. Everything is measured co in contrast to the speed of light with the maximum speed that you can achieve is basically that value C for the speed of light. And finally, the gravitational interactions, how heavy you are and how much gravitational pull you will have is measured using uh, G Newton, okay? The Newton's constant. So these are the three parameters that are labeling each of these axes. Uh, for today, we're going to mostly be on this gray shaded area of the cube, okay? This is what we're going to be discussing. This is a class of theories, and we're, we're going to be moving around, okay? There's other sides of this cube that are very interesting and very important. Uh, if there's time, you can ask me about what's happening in other corners of this cube, uh, but this is what I have time for you today, okay? The gray side. Now, um, and the objective here, my building, is basically going to be built up there, okay? This is what I want to describe. I want to be extremely good at describing gravitational phenomena that is basically lying on the top of that cube. Now, uh, let me spoil it for you a little bit <laughs> without explaining it. Uh, the, the way that we're going to manage to build that building up there is going to be uh, via this, uh, this holographic uh, principle that I will tell you more about it, don't worry. Uh, I'm just going to give you a preview, which is basically a really interesting relationship between gravitational theories and quantum theories. And so in some sense, uh, in the area of holography, what we're doing, if you want to think about it in some way, we have like two cubes, okay, with different theories, uh, different um, physical theories. And what this uh, proposal of holography is telling us that if we want to have the building on the top there, we can map it, we can make it equivalent to a different problem related to a quantum theory that is on the bottom. So that's what I'm trying to illustrate in this picture, okay? So this is our end goal, but we're going to find ourselves that we can translate it to a problem in the in quantum field theory. Very good. Okay, so now you know all of physics. Good to go. Very good. So let's dive into the second um, subject, 
general relativity, and black holes. Because who doesn't like to talk about black holes? I love to talk about black holes. This is what I do for a living. I talk about black holes all the time. OK, but let's start slow. We will get to black holes. Uh, let's talk about gravity and how gravity manifests itself. Gravity is basically the, 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 the force that is always with us. You can't avoid it, right? We, we feel it. Do we feel gravity right now? We're being pulled down? Yes, we do. And that's how it manifests for in, in, on Earth and for our experiences. We basically interpret gravity as what makes the apple fall. Gravity is also the force that makes uh, planets orbit around the, the sun. And this is how we understand gravitational phenomena. Okay? In, in the context of classical mechanics, these are the pictures. These are the type uh, of emotion that we convey to our students. Also, tidal forces, for instance, are also part of this. The physics of hurricanes, all of this is contained uh, within this framework. But very good. But we, we want to advance more than this. This is a classical, uh, very slow picture about how gravity manifests itself. And nowadays, we have a more, a better, more improved understanding of what gravitational physics is. And this is what general relativity does for us. So in general relativity, we stop drawing arrows. Okay? Uh, the gravitational force is not, a, you don't draw little arrows that point to it. The way that we understand it is that the reason why we move, the reason why we fall, is because of how the space time is deformed. Okay? It's because of the shape the curvature that space-time has. And that makes us have non-trivial motion. So in this picture here, ah, sorry, that's not the pointer. In this picture here, that's what I'm trying to illustrate. So imagine that the big object in the middle is the sun. The mass of the sun is basically distorting the space-time around it. And that distortion is why the Earth moves around in that orbit, OK? So this is our modern conception of how do we understand gravity. This is what we call the theory of general relativity. And in this theory, there's two principles that are very important. One of them came uh, from the theory of special relativity already, and it's the fact that uh, mass is equal to energy. Okay? So it's the same concept. If you have mass, it means that you have energy. You can also transform energy uh, into mass. And so if I say mass or energy throughout this lecture, you basically have to think that I'm abusing language, but for a very good reason. Now, uh, the other important equation, so I'm not writing too many equations in this lecture. I'm mostly writing them, so I remind myself to explain concepts to you, so don't, don't worry. Uh, but the second equation is uh, the equation that governs the shape of uh, the space-time that governs this curvature. And it's basically an equation that tells me uh, how the geometry, the, the different shapes that I will have uh, here, for instance, are controlled by how much energy you put into the system, how much mass you put into the system. Okay? So these are the two key principles that govern the theory of general relativity. So great. Uh, the, these are beautiful pictures. And this one, for instance, here, I am, I'm illustrating the fact that uh, because of these equivalents of energy and mass, that now in the theory of general relativity, not only massive objects are affected by gravitation, that's what happens in Newton's theory, but in the theory of general relativity, light also gets uh, distorted. Anything that carries energy will be affected by the gravitational field. Now, uh, what I want to do uh, is take you to an extreme. So let's get uncomfortable. And the way that we're going to get uncomfortable is in this picture here. Uh, so this picture is illustrating that you have two objects, one that is very big and one that is very tiny up there. And you can see from this picture that the bigger object curves the space-time more, and the tinier object curves it just a little bit. And the way I want to take you to an extreme is by considering a case where I start adding more and more mass in here, and I compress it, I collapse it. Okay, so let's put lots of it, very tightly packed. Are we okay with that? Okay, we're okay with that, I think. 
So if I do that and I, and I take this extreme of like pushing and pushing and pushing the, the mass into a single point, I will create what it's called a black hole. So it's a portion of space time of extreme curvature. And a, a good way how to think about a black hole is basically as a, as a waterfall. Okay, so imagine yourself, so you're out here in this region where everything is flat and it looks nice. So there's no extreme gravity happening in the surroundings. So imagine that this is a river and you're going, you're uh, sailing down this river. Uh, the, the effects of this black hole are basically the same effects as if you fall into the waterfall, if you get to the edge, right? And that's what's happening in this border here. And uh, it's called black because if you fall into it, you will not be able to escape and not even light will be able to escape. So that's why it was called, it was denoted as a black object, okay? Now, black holes have a really fascinating history. Uh, you, you could have hours and hours on the history uh, of black holes. They're, they're objects that for many decades were sadly discriminated. They were thought to not be real. Uh, and they basically uh, just landed in the imagination of theoretical physics. Uh, they landed in science fiction and books and novels and movies. Maybe some of you have seen some of these movies or is there any Star Trek fan? No, <laughs> one. <laughs> um, and so it, it felt that it was something very abstract and sure fascinating, but why, why, why should we care? Why should this be an important object to consider? Uh, and there's a multiple of reasons. If you want to have a pragmatic, since I'm giving you this whole engineering um, analogy. Uh, if, you, if you want it to be very pragmatic, uh, one of the reasons why uh, it's become very urgent to understand black holes is because we can hear them. They exist. Okay, so in 2017, the Nobel Prize was awarded to the LIGO uh, collaboration due to the measurement of gravitational waves, and their measurements basically uh, detected the collapse, the collision of two very massive black holes. It's a very, very violent effect in astrophysics, but it, that it's very, very difficult to detect. And finally in 2007, well, the prize was awarded in 2017, but a few years prior to that, they finally managed to measure it. It, it required a huge amount of effort, so much patience. It was truly, truly, truly remarkable. More than that, uh, we can also see them. We can also infer them. Uh, the second picture here, so the first one is still the gravitational wave collision. The second one uh, is the measurement is how we infer that there's a black hole at the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius A uh, star. And this was the reason of the Nobel Prize in 2020. Uh, we can also almost, almost see black holes. Uh, due to the Event Horizon Telescope in recent years. And here, um, if you want the black hole, is this, <laughs> it's somewhere in the middle here in the black, uh, uh, the black region here, the, this shaded uh, region that I'm saying that we can see the black hole is basically how light is behaving very, very close to the edge of this waterfall, okay? So right, kind of, it, it's not quite falling into the black hole, but it's, it's, it's getting distorted, the light is getting distorted because of the black hole in the middle and it's about to, to fall in. So these are quite exciting pictures. Uh, they're very impressive. And they're very, very difficult to, to obtain. It's, it's quite an endeavor, and I applaud the scientists behind it. I had nothing to do with them, uh, but it's very impressive. When I was a young student, I never thought that I was going to be able to present this type of, of data. But okay, we're going to continue talking though about black holes in a theoretical sense. Uh, but this, in some sense, in the back of my mind, inspires me that th this is not just my imagination, okay? <laughs> These are real objects uh, that we're going to encounter. And in a theoretical perspective, uh, there's many aspects of black holes that are simple, okay? Black holes are very elegant. They're very sophisticated, okay? They're described, which means in a physics context, uh, means that they are described by very few parameters. One of the parameters that, that we will care about is its size. 
which uh, we will call basically uh, the event horizon. So this region for which after this you cannot pass anymore. Now, one thing that I want you to keep in mind uh, here, I have limitations in the sense of like, I'm drawing things on a screen, so they look a bit flat. So I'm drawing these circles that will encapsulate the size of the black hole. But I want you to think of the black hole as, think of it if you want as a planet, okay? So it occupies a volume. And this red circle that I'm drawing there in the, in the picture basically is the surface of this sphere, okay, that occupies a volume, okay? But it's just a little bit complicated to draw volumes and to encapsulate this idea, okay? But it's, it, it, the black hole is basically a big fat thing there. And the size is basically a sphere that surrounds it. Very good. So how big the black hole is, uh, is basically determined by how much mass you have. This is the characteristic that determines the size of it. And instead of writing the equation for you, I decided that it would be more fun to give you some numbers uh, to illustrate how extreme and how dense uh, black holes are. So I picked randomly uh, three different objects uh, that I hope we're all familiar with, the sun, the earth, and a human being. Uh, I apologize that I, I, well, should I apologize or not? Maybe not. Uh, so in physics, we use kilograms, meters, and seconds to measure things. I did not write them in pounds, miles, or feet. Uh, but basically, that, that won't matter if you're not familiar uh, with this. Uh, the, the key point will come uh, very soon. But what I want you to uh, consider are these objects that have a given mass, okay? And here in the second column, I wrote down what their actual size is, okay? So to give you a reference, just uh, when I say uh, a human being with mass 70 kilograms, that's roughly like me. I'm a little bit lighter, but approximately me. Uh, and uh, the size here, 1.8 meters is, well, I'm like 1.7, so it's a little bit taller than me, okay? just to give you a reference. And these are the sizes, the actual size of Earth and the size of the Sun in meters. Now, if I have this amount of mass and I ask you, compress it, form a black hole, okay? With this amount of mass, start making it denser and denser and denser, start curving space-time more and more. If you do that, the size of the black hole, so the size of this region here, will be these values. And what I want to illustrate to you, how different the actual size is relative to the size of the black hole. So if I am a black hole, if I become one, my size will not be this, it will not be this, it will not be this. It will be 10 to the minus 25 smaller than I actually are. This is even smaller than an atom. This is how dense these objects are, okay? This is how extreme you went to into forming a black hole. The sun, the same thing. Like you can see here, this number is huge, but if you make it into a black hole, it's orders and orders of magnitudes smaller than its actual size. But very good. This is the black hole. This is basically the, the, the densities that we're talking about in terms of these objects. Now, uh, what I want to ask you or think about for a moment uh, it's about uh, one of the basic, uh, well, one of the very important revolutions that happen in, in, in theoretical physics. And it's the fact that uh, black holes uh, are allowed to carry information. They have mass in them. And so for the, from that basic uh, principle, they will be able to carry information. But you might ask, what is information? So what, how, how are we quantifying this? What, what does this lady mean by information? So by information, I mean the following. Uh, it's a concept that is used a lot in thermodynamics. So let me for, let's forget for a second about black holes and let me just tell you what I mean by information. So think about this room, let's say, okay? Uh, this room is like a box and it's filled with air. We breathe it. Uh, and one of the questions that we ask in, in thermodynamics or in statistical mechanics is basically the air in this room, how many possible configurations can it have, OK? 
Okay? And what is the most likely configuration, what is the most likely distribution that the air in this room will have? Okay? That concept, that, that how much information you can store, so basically how many different configurations you can have and the probabilities of those configurations, is uh, captured by a quantity that we call entropy. Okay? It's basically telling us the possible number of configurations that you can have inside of this box. Now, in this very simple system that I'm drawing here, so basically a box filled uh, with molecules, uh, the amount of entropy, so the number of configurations that you can have, uh, very intuitively depends on the size of the box, right? If the box is bigger, then you can put more stuff into it. You will have more allowed configurations for your particles in it. If the box is smaller, then you have less possible configurations for what's inside, okay? So this is what we, one way that we quantify information uh, in physics. Uh, so now let's apply this to black holes. So black holes, because they're objects that carry mass, you will intuitively say, of course, if you throw things into it, as these two gentlemen here are doing, they will be eating up information, right? So there will, there will be molecules inside of it, and they will have different configurations inside of it. And so, naively, you will say, yes, they do carry information, but the key question is how much? How much information does a black hole store? What are their secrets inside of it that we can't see? So they have stuff inside of it, how much? And in trying to under, uh, quantify uh, this question, how much information a black, uh, black hole carries, you start to have to, you need to start understanding how can you reconcile the theory of general relativity with quantum mechanics, because you have to start thinking about if I start probing or testing this black hole with matter, with either uh, with quantum matter, how can I see the effects that it has some entropy, some information stored inside of it? And this led to one of the most beautiful results that has been the obsession for many of us is that, well, the answer is yes, uh, the black holes carry entropy. And moreover, uh, in, in, in the context of thermodynamics, uh, these black holes behave in a very similar fashion as a cup of tea or as the air uh, in this room, meaning that, uh, they, that you can associate a temperature to them. This is called the Hawking temperature. And so in this picture here, I changed the picture of the black hole because I want to illustrate to you that when we try to reconcile uh, this a general relativity with quantum mechanics, the black holes are no longer that black, okay? So they will radiate, uh, and, and, and this is what this funky lines here are trying to uh, depict. So they're not that uh, black, um, but very good. So this is one important concept of uh, black holes. However, what is quite revolutionary is that the amount of entropy that they capture that they contain is not controlled by the volume. So they're a little bit different than these molecules inside of this. Although the black hole occupies a volume and it, it, it has some, uh, it occupies some uh, portion of space, the entropy you would have thought naively would have gone with the volume of that space, but no, it goes with the area of that space. And this was quite dramatic. This is quite radical not expected, it's beautiful, it's fantastic. This is called the Bekenstein uh, Hawking entropy, uh, but we will keep this because it will be important. Now, the third feature uh, of this formula, which is fantastic, uh, is the constants that appear here telling me how much entropy I have. So these same parameters, the speed of light, G Newton, H bar, are basically the same uh, parameters that we were using to describe our cube. All three fundamental constants of physics show up in this equation. So there's two things that, at least at the minimum, uh, two things that we learn from this exercise, from studying black holes uh, and their mathematical properties. Uh, the first um, lesson is that the theory of general relativity appears to be uh, very smart, very wise, and it's a theory that knew about thermodynamics. So we were not aiming, like 
we, we were trying to describe gravitational force and we stumbled into the laws of thermodynamics, quite surprisingly. Uh, and the second is what I'm going to call uh, the fact that gravity behaves in a way that is holographic, meaning um, that this equation here is controlled by areas and not controlled uh, by volumes. Now, uh, when we have this equation and we stare at it more and more, uh, the, the, one of some of the basic questions as we try to understand what does it mean to describe a theory of quantum gravity, one of the, the most basic questions is that when I, when I cast this formula for you, you would ask what comes to mind is like, but what are the molecules? What, what was this made of? I don't know. Because if it was made of things that we were familiar with, I would have gotten a volume. But I got an area. <laughs> so there's something funny going on here, and, and, and we need to try to understand it. And a theory of quantum gravity should provide those answers. And in that, in that context, uh, the most successful framework in trying to understand what, what these molecules are, what is composing the black hole, this is where string theory comes in. So, okay, so let's get to work. Uh, we need to figure out what quantum gravity is. It's, it's urgent. It's important. I hope that I convey that a little bit. <laughs> okay, very good. So let's, uh, let's start implementing. So we'll, we'll explain what this, I, I've been using this word holography and I have not ex uh, defined it uh, very carefully. So, so let's, let's, let's do that. Okay, so what, what is this holography thing that uh, I keep on uh, coming into? So, blank slide on purpose. So, uh, one thing that I want you to keep in mind uh, is that uh, this is going to be a framework uh, and a, uh, that is going to relate two things that are seemingly very different, uh, but we have justifications for it. Uh, and the, uh, the justifications, the conceptions, uh, come from uh, string theory. Uh, this is how we uh, basically realized the details, we justified all of the things. It was very much motivated by the physics of black holes. There were various uh, physicists that suspected that something like this had to, to happen, uh, what I'm about to present to you. Uh, but it really came in, in a solid, uh, concise way with the framework of string theory. This is one of the successes, one of the most powerful things uh, that we have come to learn from studying string theory, in my humble opinion. Okay, so holography. What do I mean by holography? Uh, so it's, it's what you're familiar with. So uh, I think all of you in your wallet have a hologram, I believe. I hope, did you all come with your ID today? <laughs> I hope so. Uh, so that's what I, what I mean by uh, holography is basically a 2D uh, surface that captures a very precise 3D image, okay? And so they show up in our identification. So you see these funny little holograms in our IDs. Uh, back in the day, they also showed up in our credit cards. Nowadays, I don't know, my credit card doesn't have one anymore, but uh, I'm old enough that my first credit cards that had holograms on them. Uh, but this is literally what I mean, okay? Uh, and so the concept of this holographic principle uh, will be this. It will be projecting a volume uh, basically uh, a 3D image into, into a screen, okay? And a good analogy as well to encompass this of how information about a volume is contained on a surface is to think about a can of soup. So you go to the store and you wanna buy some soup, right? You grab the can. Do you need to open the can to know what's inside of it? Do any of you do that? I hope not. You're not allowed to, <laughs> in case you, you were, right? You, you read the label. If you read the label of the can, you know what's inside, okay? So this is how this principle is going to work. Uh, we're going to, all the information that you need to know about what's happening inside is going to be contained uh, on the surface uh, as a, in a can of soup. Uh, more mathematically, basically in this figure that I'm presenting here, I mean that uh, if, you, if you have some intricate uh, figure in the middle is actually all the term 
by what's happening at the boundary. You specify what happens at the boundary, and that allows you to reconstruct what's happening uh, in the middle. And what we're going to do uh, in the last, I'm running a bit late, I think. Oh, no, it's okay. Um, I hope. Uh, what we're going to do is apply this to the concept uh, of gravity. Okay, so how do we think of gravity in, in this setup? So the proposal is the following. So let me present to you again the, the picture that we have here. So we're going to think of gravity of, of being the soup. Okay, so it's going to be what's inside of the can. Okay, it's the soupy stuff. And the label uh, is going to be uh, this quantum theory uh, living on the edge. A more precise statement of this correspondence, so a more formal without using the word soup, uh, what we say in our field is basically that, we, uh, that a gravitational theory in a D number of uh, dimensions is equivalent to a quantum theory in one dimension less. Okay, this is the statement, this is the proposal of the holographic uh, principle. There's various ways how we draw this. Uh, uh, we draw it in a, in, in a finite region, but um, so we put gravity in, the, in these pictures. Gravity is sitting inside here or here, but, um, and I'm drawing like the boundary at, at a finite position, like up here or on the edge of the cylinder. But in, in, in reality, uh, gravity occupies the entire like universe, okay? So I'm just drawing the boundary so that you can see that I'm trying to put these things into, into correspondence. Now, a good way how to detect someone working in this field, um, especially if you go to a restaurant and you hear people in the other table, you'll be able to detect a holographer by the following jargon. So we don't talk, like when we talk, we don't say gravity and quantum theory all the time. Well, sometimes we do, uh, but a, a, a neat uh, piece of jargon is that you will keep on hearing people talking about the bulk theory and the boundary theory. That's how you detect a holographer, okay? You hear boundary, bulk, boundary, bulk, and you're like, that guy is a string theorist. Done. Cross it out, okay? I, I might be using this jargon. I hope I don't, but just so you know, uh, th this is um, basically terminology. So now, now you're insiders uh, of the field. Okay, very good. Now, there's something really interesting about how these theories are related, how they're equivalent. Uh, because as you try to understand the relationship, uh, we can explore in the context even of this cube uh, how the correspondence changes if you start probing things at different scales. So for example, uh, here I'm being very vague about what do I mean by gravity. So for instance, I can mean by gravity the theory of general relativity, okay? plus some additional matter, whatever favorite matter you have. So I can say that that's my uh, gravitational here in this volume. And uh, the, the proposal of this principle, what string theory has taught us, is that if, in, if here you're in a point, in this point of the cube, your uh, equivalent description is, term, is in terms of a quantum theory that has very strong interactions, okay? So the particles in, in, on, on this edge are talking to each other a lot, okay? They're colliding constantly, okay? They're not like uh, antisocial. Now, uh, you can also do a different thing. So you can, for instance, put a very, very, very quantum theory of gravity there. So you can put a string theory uh, with parameters uh, that basically, and technically speaking, makes it tensionless. It doesn't matter, but the point is that uh, if you put here a, a very quantum theory of gravity, you can make the interactions here uh, very, very weak, okay? So very floppy, okay? So depending on, on where you're sitting and on the top of this edge is basically going to dictate some rules and some properties about what the quantum theory on the edge uh, is, okay? And this has provided to be quite powerful. So let me go back to this when, general, when I have just general relativity here and I have the strong interactions, uh, this is where we start finding a lot of synergy with other areas of physics. So something that this principle has been extremely successful uh, to do is to build bridges and to build bridges with other areas of physics. So using this principle, 
we can connect gravitational phenomena to the quark gluon plasma. We can connect gravitational phenomena to superconductors. Uh, we can connect them to hydrodynamics, uh, to non-relativistic materials, to quantum information. And this is why so much expertise starts showing up as we're trying to understand what is quantum gravity? Because in this correspondence, we're very, uh, in very novel and surprising ways, we're realizing that a lot of the equations, a lot of the principles that we're studying are the same. And then this expertise becomes extremely valuable in both ways. Now, uh, it also has been quite important uh, to understand paradoxes that happen in uh, the area of quantum gravity. So I Probably for those of you that were here during the physics cafe, I'm sure Amit and Ying talked about some of these paradoxes and maybe who was right and who was wrong. I don't know, but uh, the, the holographic principle has been an incredibly powerful tool in, in understanding basically the origin of this equation, but also what happens to it dynamically. So what happens as the black hole keeps on emitting based on this temperature, it keeps on evaporating. And, and, and the past four years have been extremely productive. And many of the participants in this conference have been key in understanding uh, what is happening. And they have gotten prizes for the, the, this is very important, important, important work. Uh, but what I want to do in the last few minutes that I have, um, I believe so, yes, <laughs> no, uh, is to, is I want to illustrate to you uh, three open questions that we have in this field, okay? So what, what are we doing right now? And in particular, what, are, what have we been doing during this conference? What have we been discussing? What are the presentations? What are the talks that we, we have? Uh, it won't encapsulate absolutely everything that we're thinking about. Uh, it's just basically my three uh, favorite things. <laughs> uh, but it, it's also because I cannot list everything, but to give you a flavor of the type of questions that we have. So one of the first uh, open questions, and, and this is where I have been lying to you a little bit. <laughs> so um, we do have some limitations um, in, in our holographic principle. Um, so no, I didn't lie to you. Sorry, no, I shouldn't say that. No, I did not lie. I just didn't tell you the whole story from the beginning, okay? So let me just tell you a little bit about more of the whole story. So when I said that uh, string theory was very good at telling us how to build and describe uh, this holographic principle, it does, uh, but it does it for certain types of gravitational theories uh, that have what we call negative curvature. Uh, but in, in reality, uh, we will, which are very interesting theories, they're fascinating theories, and all of this progress that I've shown you before, and all of these connections, were in these contexts where we have this negative curvature. Uh, but we want more, we're ambitious, we, we won't settle, okay, so this is not the end. Uh, we want to describe uh, this holographic correspondence uh, beyond uh, 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 gravitational theories that have negative curvature. For instance, our universe has positive curvature. We also want to describe uh, gravity in a holographic way in our own universe. We also want to do it when we have no curvature at all. So if you have zero curvature, like in, in this room, which is pretty flat, we also want to be able to do that. And, and, and this is an endeavor that is being pursued uh, by many, many scientists and progress is being done slowly, but it's one of like, it's at the frontier of what we want to achieve, okay? So this is uh, basically the state of the art. This is where we feel comfortable where we feel safe, but we want to push it more, okay? And by pushing it on uh, this green, uh, red region. Now the second question, which is very close to my heart because I do work on this uh, quite a lot, is to say, okay, we have this correspondence. Um, let's put it to work. Let's put it to work in the sense that uh, I want to uh, go backwards in the sense that I want to start with this blue theory and I want to have complete control on this design. I want to understand all of the rules of how can I, what are the materials that I need? What are the tools that are required for me to systematically tell you how do I get the theory of general relativity from this blue region, okay? So this is a very, this is my very engineering hat that I put on 
uh, every day and trying to understand what are the rules here. Uh, it's challenging because uh, there, we have certain limitations and so a lot of our work is just trying to understand what are these possible materials that we can use, what are the tools that are needed in order to get uh, this to work. So this is, a, this is one, another important uh, area of discovery. And finally, my third question uh, is in regards to uh, basically exploring all possible corners of the geometry of the gravitational theory using this correspondence. So one question that is uh, very prominent in this area is uh, what happens if you fall into a black hole? So here, I didn't, my black hole here is drawn in a little bit of a boring way, so I put the event horizon as the screen there, so that's the edge of the waterfall. Um, and imagine that you, you're in a rocket and you say, okay, I'm going to go and jump in, right? Uh, in principle, that has to have a very clear and precise description from the point of view of this boundary theory and, and this is an, uh, we, we've had beautiful talks uh, this week uh, trying to describe what is happening. How do I describe that? Uh, how does that look differently at different instances of time? And that, how it, does it make it compatible with the fact that the black hole is evaporating? Uh, this is a very, very challenging question. It's not an easy question uh, to, to answer. Uh, but it's a very important one because it will tell us all that we need to know about black holes. So with that, I basically reached the end, I'm done. So I talked about everything, basically, right? I feel that I went through the entire like, realm of physics. I'm losing my breath. Uh, but I, I hope you had fun. I, I hope you enjoyed uh, the ride. And I, wanna, I want to leave you as a final picture. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one of my favorite pictures of Escher. Um, by the way, he's Dutch, and since I work in the Netherlands, I thought it's, that's why I keep on using uh, his images. Um, uh, just to tell you how we're kind of like exploring our world. So there's portions of our life that we're on this screen, but then sometimes we dive up into the volume and then we go back in, and it kind of keeps on exploring all of this. Um, and, Things. So we have our two cubes and we're trying to basically, starting from here, get up there. So with that, uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much for the wonderful tour in size, uh, speed, and the mass. So uh, I'm sure there are questions and uh, I think we have some time to take questions. Please raise your hand. There's okay, a question. Down there, you can talk. Yeah. Yeah. A very simplistic uh, approach of a black hole is from what knowledge I have is the star that collapsed and yes. created a huge mass, a small but very powerful mass. Um, the universe is creating a lot of black holes. Yes, many of them. And Uh, yeah, because they, they tend to be, so black holes are sneaky in various ways. So the three images that I, I, I showed uh, at some point in the lecture, yes, yeah, so, well, okay, number one, yes, there's many black holes. There's many of them. Uh, because they, they're basically, at, at the minimum level, as you just said, they correspond to the death of a star. Okay, and, and once the, the star dies and, and it forms this very massive black hole, then the black hole is very hungry and it starts also eating up things around it. And, and that's also how they get bigger and bigger. Uh, now, um, the reason why it's not so easy to see them is because as I, uh, as I was trying to illustrate, um, if you have, um, a black hole that, for instance, has the size of the sun, sorry, the, the amount of mass of, of the sun, its size is very, very, very tiny. Uh, so they, they, they don't occupy a lot of space. So they're pretty heavy, but they're very, very tiny. And because they're black, it, it's, it's hard to, like, you can't see them very clearly. So th that's why it took a lot of effort in trying to see them. Now, we have now better tools. And, and these uh, experiments that uh, um, 
do measurements of gravitational waves are actually showing to us, they didn't just detect one event, they didn't just detect one collision of black holes, but they'd have detected many. And it is actually surprisingly how many they have detected, uh, which I don't know, for me at least it was, I, I thought that there was going to be a few of, of these events and they were going to be very sporadic, but they actually, they happen very frequently. So there's lots of black holes there and hopefully we don't run into one of them. <laughs> Oof, this is one of the most difficult questions you can ask me. I am. <laughs> well, you look. For, first of all, uh, you will not encounter your daughter and and start pushing books in that bookshelf. I don't know if you've seen the movie. Have you seen the movie? No, maybe she's seen the movie. Uh, doesn't it doesn't matter. Uh, we. This is one of the. Okay, naively, uh, if I don't know any better, uh, you will when you cross the horizon. That will feel fine. You, will, you basically won't notice that you went into the black hole. Your friends will notice that you're missing, but you will go into the black hole and then there's going to be uh, some amount of time that you will be lingering in there. But eventually at some point, um, the, the black hole basically ends. It ends at the singularity where all the mass is concentrated and uh, I'll miss you terribly. This is the, it's going to be the end to you. Now, uh, it, the, well, we're trying to understand a bit more precisely what's happening uh, and, and incorporate quantum mechanics in answering these questions and understand fully at all possible stages of the life of a black hole what's going to happen to you. So that, that's why I'm saying it's a very difficult question. But uh, to first approximation, you'll die for sure. Okay, so the lady there and the Hi. Hi. Um, Mm -hmm. and looking at uh, the, the area, not the volume, yes. of what is there, how do you come up with your boundary? Uh, how do we know? Is that an arbitrary thing? No, 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 it's not arbitrary. So that, that's why, that was part of my second question. It's not arbitrary. So depending on what you put at the boundary will tell you what type of gravity theory you have in the middle. And, and this is part of the... So we have some very specific examples of like, okay, if you have a very specific blue boundary, we know very specifically what is the red uh, thing in the middle, what is the soup. Uh, but uh, we don't know it for every, like for any choice of blue, uh, we're still trying to understand what is the red. Uh, th this is part of like our having a more deeper and having control on, on uh, as we build these blueprints that are going to tell us what quantum gravity is, is understanding like what is the, the, the precision. Exactly. The yes, yes. I got lost, <laughs> but um, um, <laughs> yeah, that, that was that, that was a lot of uh, uh, concepts there. But um, okay, um, so in let me just say the following. So um, when okay, so the, the first uh, concept to keep in mind is that uh, yes, anytime that you have energy. Or, or mass, um, which are basically in, in this context 
equivalent, um, they will distort your space time. Okay, they they induce some shape into the to the space time. Now uh, these gravitational waves that that occur um, occur because you're making um, you're making these two very objects that are very heavy basically collide against each other, so they're exchanging a lot of mass and exchanging a lot of energy, and this creates this, uh, it makes this, this space time around it uh, change. Okay, so that, that's a manifestation of uh, uh, basically how the mass and the energy is being uh, transferred uh, through the, and it's affecting the entire system. So that's one point, but then you were mentioning the interior of the black hole, and if this helps us understanding what's happening at the singularity. Right, but also the release of what, are, what would be called the time state, and you could have entangled particles um, in, in principle, it's within the realm of possibilities. Um, unfortunately, some of these effects, at least to our current understanding, they're very, very small. And so we don't know if it's a pragmatic statement yet. Uh, there might be a chance, but it's quite right. Right now, it's uh, out of our reach. But I know of a few people thinking that maybe uh, part of this gravitational waves that are emitted, if you are good enough at doing measurements, you might uh, understand some of these quantum properties. But we're, we're not there yet. So uh, at the level that the technology is right now, the answer, unfortunately, is no. But uh, we'll keep on working on it. What about the aggregate amount of um, annual momentum that appears to be possibly responsible for the release of the gravitational waves? That doesn't add anything. Like it's just part of the whole effect. But it, we're not. Um, it, it doesn't give us a, something new to. It's still going to be. All of these effects are at this state are very macroscopic, uh, and we. It hasn't been able to tell us something about what's happening at very, very, very short distances. It's telling us what's happening at, at bigger distances. So there is angular momentum and, and a lot of the, the simulations and, 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 the, and, and uh, the data that you see take this into account. Uh, so it, it, it's part of the computations, but they're all at the, um, what, what captures well the data right now, it's all very macroscopic effects. Um, well, let's take uh, some other questions. Down there. Your concept of the suitcase takes a three-dimensional object yes. and basically creates a holographic just put on a punch card or whatever. Yes. Uh, now, but I think there are there also holograms that you could have your double hologram next to you out, out in space without a screen. Ah, but that's a different type of hologram. Yeah. So yeah, you could have also, and, and in physics, that also sometimes there, there's also what we call dualities in, in that regard. That you can map uh, me to some other system, but it, it's not the. Uh, it just happens to not be what I'm using uh, in order to describe Is quantum gravity. Based on the same principle. Uh, it not well. It depends on what you mean by the principle. Uh, <laughs> Meaning, sorry, I'm, uh, you know, scientists, we like to be precise. <laughs> and um, uh, I, did, I just mean that there, like it, in, in physics, uh, there, there's more than one type of equivalence that we encounter. Sometimes the equivalences that we encounter happen in the same number of dimensions. And they're, they're quite beautiful and remarkable. So we learned that there, there's a uh, similar set of equations and, 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 and laws that govern seemingly two very different uh, type of phenomena. So that will be an example where you're, you're mapping something here to something here and, and, and naively would have thought, oh, it's different, but it's actually the same thing. Uh, this is an, an example in physics where you don't have to preserve the number of dimensions. So it's a bit more radical from that point of view because you would have thought that if you had information in a volume, it still had to be described by another volume. And what I'm proposing today, what, what we're studying is basically saying, no, actually the volume was too redundant and, and you can, everything that you needed to know can go into the surface. That's the idea.
Uh, I think it's time to thank the speakers. So thank you very much.